Christian Helen. Our next speaker is um, Seamus Mill, who is he's with us now. He's, he's a writer and observer, was an observer at the October presidential election. So we've got another report back here as well. So Seamus, over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Jen. Thanks very much to all of you for coming today. It's a fantastic turnout, and I think it's just a measure of how many people understand the importance of what's been taking place in Latin America and Venezuela in particular. Because, of course, it's been a, a very tumultuous period uh, in the last few weeks for Venezuela and for the whole of Latin America, in a way. Um, we've seen, obviously, the death of Hugo Chavez, and people are mourning uh, rightly, but also celebrating someone who was an outstanding champion of the poor and the oppressed, of the independence of Latin America, and also, I don't think it's taking it too far to say, the rebirth of socialism uh, in our time. And then we've seen this month the election of Nicolas Maduro, which is itself the 17th uh, election or referendum victory by the Chavista movement, the progressive movement uh, in Venezuela. And then since that election, we've seen the new attempts by the opposition to both unleash violence and destabilization, but also a new level of support for that process openly coming from the United States of America. So I think you, it's, it's necessary when we're looking at these events to stand back a bit to see the significance and the importance of, of what's really going on. Because if you think back 20 years ago, at the end of the Cold War and the end of the Soviet Union, we were told that free market capitalism had triumphed, that we, there was now to be a unipolar world dominated by the United States without rivals, uh, that socialism had died and been thrown into the dustbin of history. In fact, that history itself had come to an end, and there were no alternatives in the 21st century. So, two decades on, that looks pretty ridiculous. And I think four things have changed that fundamentally. The first is the strategic defeat of the United States in the war on terror and the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan. The second is the crash of 2008 and the crisis of neoliberalism that that has unleashed. The third is the rise of China. And the fourth, and the most hopeful for many people in the world, is the progressive tide that has swept Latin America throughout the past decade. The, they're all con connected, these developments, but I think it's crucial that Latin America was the first region of the world to experience the full force of neoliberalism and its utter failures, and the first to revolt against it. That's going back to Chile under Pinochet in the 1970s, right the way through the following decades. And of course, in the wake of the Caracasa massacre in Venezuela at the end of the 1980s, and then the crisis of 1998, it was Venezuela and Hugo Chavez who spearheaded that transformation of an entire region, which swept away the old political elites that brought to power a string of social democratic and more radical socialist governments across the region, from Ecuador to Brazil, from Bolivia to Argentina, challenging US domination and neoliberal orthodoxy, attacking social and racial inequality, building regional integration in a new way for the first time creating an independent Latin America, the foundations of an independent Latin America for the first time for 500 years, constructing grassroots democracy in a new way and taking back resources uh, from corporate control. It was in Venezuela, and I'm sure this has been discussed a lot today, but I think it's worth repeating. It was in Venezuela that the government first used oil in a new way to slash poverty 50% poverty reduction overall, 70% reduction in extreme poverty under the Chavez government. Huge increases in spending and resources in health and education. Massive cuts in inequality in the country. And across Latin America, it was 
Chavez and the Bolivarian Revolution that led the drive for regional integration, laying the foundations for the new independence of the region, using its wealth across the region for outstanding humanitarian initi initiatives like the uh, human operations for over blindness that have taken place across the region and support for progressive change throughout the continent. And of course, globally, it's been Venezuela that has most of all demonstrated 20 years after we were told there is no alternative in the 21st century, that neoliberalism can be rejected, that new forms of socialism can be constructed, that another world isn't just possible, but is being created in the here and now, right now, in the 21st century. So it's for all that that Hugo Chavez and Venezuela and now Nicolas Maduro uh, have been abused and misrepresented most ludicrously as a dictatorship. And as people who are so incompetent, the economy is on its hands and knees. Now, none of that is true. They wouldn't have, Chavez wouldn't have been re-elected and Maduro wouldn't have been elected, re elected this month unless they had delivered for the majority of people in Venezuela. The claim that we've heard a lot in the last two months, that Chavez and the Bolivarian Revolution ruined the uh, Venezuelan economy, is made a mockery of if you actually look at the facts and the statistics of the Venezuelan economy over the last decade. If you look at the figures on growth, on unemployment, on poverty, on pensions, on malnutrition, on social spending, even on inflation, which is, remains a problem, they, they represent a huge improvement on what uh, took place before. And that's the basis of the electoral success of Chavez and now the Chavistas in his uh, wake. And first and foremost, the dignity that that has given to people across the country and across the continent. Now, none of that's to say that there aren't serious problems in Venezuela and serious challenges. Not only corruption, which is uh, a, a, ser a serious problem in the country, high levels of violent crime, problems in administration, problems of underinvestment. And those are the challenges for Venezuelan socialists to overcome, to maintain the momentum of change uh, in the next period. But Chavez and now Venezuela under Maduro are under attack not for their failures but for their successes. And they are enormous and historic successes. And that attack is coming in the form, as we've heard already, of destabilization both internally and externally. You only have to go back and remember what happened uh, more than a decade ago in 2002 and the enthusiasm with which the Western world, the United States and of course the oligarchy and the class forces that stood to lose out in Venezuela supported the coup attempt against Chavez in that year. And what we're seeing now in the refusal to accept what is clearly a democratic result in the latest presidential uh, election is another form of that process. And what's alarming is that the United States uh, is much more openly orchestrating and interfering in what John Kerry called last week, once again, America's backyard. How humiliating, how despicable to talk about an entire region, an entire continent uh, in such a way. And I think that refusal to recognize the election result by the United States is clearly a signal uh, to the opposition, uh, to go harder, to destabilize more, to use the kind of violence that has been used in the last couple of weeks. Now, anyone who imagines that this is all in the fevered imagination of Venezuelan, Venezuelan Bolivarians and revolutionaries only has to look at the content of the 2006 US ambassador's cable that was re recently leaked uh, under the WikiLeaks uh, program uh, that spelt out, and this is just the State Department, not the CIA by the way, it's spelt out a five point strategy for penetration, for destabilization, for division,
for, to, for protecting US business interests and for isolating the Chavista movement in Venezuela. So we don't have to take uh, the, the, the word of it, uh, the word of the Venezuelan uh, socialist for it. Just listen to what the United States employees say themselves about uh, what they're up to and the scale of funding, as we've already heard, of the opposition and opposition movements is huge in Venezuela. That is what the Venezuelan government and socialist movement uh, is up against. Now, it's clear from what we've seen in the last few years that the tide can be turned, the progressive tide in Latin America can be turned. We saw what happened in Honduras in 2009 where a violent coup d'etat overthrew a progressive leadership and as Hillary Clinton said at the time, uh, the process was managed to a successful conclusion. <laughs> by which she meant that the coup makers stood and took power in its aftermath. And last year in Paraguay, we saw a softer version of the same process. And last week, a, the return of the traditional right-wing oligarchic uh, political leadership in Paraguay, with all, in all its gory glory, uh, gives us a taste of what uh, can happen. So it's clear that the, these processes are not inevitable and they can be turned back. In Venezuela, I think it's clear that the Chavista movement and the government, the new government under Maduro, is prepared and is ready to overcome its problems. That's their task. Our task in Britain and in the rest of the world is to learn from their experience, their very important experience in this period. And Take inspiration from it for what we're doing in our own countries. And give solidarity to the Venezuelans in their confrontation with extremely powerful forces inside and outside uh, the country. But I'm convinced that the transformation that Hugo Chavez and the Bolivarians unleashed in Venezuela has very, very deep roots. It's inspired a movement across an entire continent. It's deeply popular, despite its problems. And it will continue. Thanks very much.